We are. We are. We are cultivate. 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 We are cultivate. Hello and welcome to Yield Crime, where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stengel. Hello. Hi. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. On a Monday. I know. 2024 is coming in hot. It's like, listen... It's Monday. We gotta we gotta get this figured out. So before we get into it, mm-hmm. I wanted to take a second to thank our monthly supporter Elizabeth over on Buy Me a Coffee. We appreciate you. Yeah, that's really nice. Thank you so much. And if you'd like to become a monthly sustainer as well or give a one-time donation, please check out the link in our show notes or head on over to buymeacoffee.com slash ye old crime. Nice. Today's topic, the starving time at Jamestown. Oh no. Mm-hmm. You really, you're going to Jamestown today. You're starting yep. the year with Jamestown. I'm bringing us in hot. Dang, you just really kicked the door down to 2024, didn't you? I did. I did. And threw a Molotov cocktail in the, in the, in the doorway. I chose violence. You really did. I was like, you know what, 2024, <laughs> I'm going to fuck your shit up. Mm-hmm. We're about to get rocked. Real hard. Okay. So, information was pulled from the following sources. A 2023 history article by Sarah Pruitt. 2021 Historic Jamestown Article, 2017 Wired Article by Liette Clark, 2015 Real Archaeology Blog Post by B.R. Rodriguez, 2014 Archaeology Article by Nikhail Salminathan, yes, 2013 BBC News Article by Jane O'Brien, 2013 CNN Article by Elizabeth Landau, 2013 The New York Times Article by Nicholas Wade, 2013 Reuters article by Deborah Zabarenko. 2013 Smithsonian Magazine article by Joseph Stromberg. 2013 U.S. News article by Jason Kobler. 2007 Colonial Williamsburg article by Dennis Montgomery. A Jamestown Discovery video and Wikipedia. Nice. And links to all of these articles will be included in the show notes. Jamestown was originally founded in Virginia on May 13th, 1607, by 104 settlers from the ships Discovery, Godspeed, and Susan Constant, who had left England in December of 1606. Nice. I love that I love that they were like normal ship names and then Susan. Susan Constant. Because mm-hmm. Susan is constant. She is. She was then. She got him She there. was then. She was like, we're going to get there. She's like, I I will take you there. Discovery will get there first. Godspeed Mm -hmm. will bring up the middle. And I'm going to be the constant. Yep. Constant Susan. Don't worry. That's what they call me. Don't worry, it's Sue. She's coming. The colonists sailed up the James River before settling on a marshy peninsula, which in hindsight was a horrible choice for a number of reasons. One being the fact that their water wells were between the river which could have high salt levels depending on the time of year, and a mm-hmm. pitch and tar swamp. Cute. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it kind of sounds a bit like a floodplain. Yep. It also cool. didn't boast much in the way of game, which were pretty much right. hunted to death right off the bat. Because they probably had no idea and just thought that like there were millions and millions of deer and rabbits and things to eat. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So let's just murder all the things right out the gate. Jamestown was built as a military settlement and consisted of a wooden fort, a storehouse, a church, and several houses. Not right away, but eventually. 
it would contain all of those things. Oh, that makes sense. Could you imagine if they're, they got off the ship and they're like, okay, let's get to work and just started <laughs> going to town, building all that stuff. You two start working on the church. Right. <laughs> you start working on the pews. <laughs> I'll go I'll go braid some crosses out of like twine. Of those 104 original settlers, only 38 survived the first 9 months. Damn. And this yeah. was a military settlement, so it's not like these people yeah. were weak. Yeah, this was all men. It was all men. Yeah. Wow. So at first I was like, okay, well like women and children, you know, New environment nope. stuff, shock to the system, dead. No, those were men. All men. Like mm -hmm. war. Yeah. Like men that would have been capable for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Those who perished died either from disease, such as malaria, mm -hmm. or starvation, having arrived during one of the worst droughts in centuries. Great. Yeah, I don't think uh, God wanted you there if the drought happened. That's just me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But fair. I think I think he was trying to tell you to go go away. <laughs> yep. In fact, according to Dennis Blanton, director of the Center for Archaeological Research at the College of William and Mary, is quoted as telling National Parks Magazine, "quote If the English had tried to find a worse time to launch their settlement in the New World." They could not have done so. The Jamestown settlement was plagued by the driest seven-year episode in 770 years, end quote. Cool. So I'd love to meet the man that saw that, par that part of land, like that plot of land, and was like, this, this mm -hmm. right here. Hell yeah. This is it, boys. Yep, we this did it. it. Fun fact. Dennis, so the guy that I just quoted, was part of a team that was investigating the mystery surrounding the lost settlers of Roanoke Island. And part of his mm. team took core samples from the thousand-year-old bald cypress trees in the area. These samples confirmed that the drought was at its worst during the years that the settlement was created at Jamestown and earlier during the founding of the lost colony. I mean, that checks out. So just backing up their theory. Yeah. It's crazy how how much knowledge trees can give us, you know? Mm -hmm. Those rings. I'm going to continue on this vein before we jump back into the history. In 2013, geologists from William, William and Mary College teamed up with the National Geographic Society and attempted mm -hmm. to figure out why the settlement at Jamestown was in such mm -hmm. worse shape compared to others that were developed nearby like at Chesapeake Bay, for example. Yeah. Their hypothesis revolved around water contamination, which makes sense. Yeah. The group were able to gather samples from the original, the three original wells in a shallow aquifer that supplied water to them. Their tests showed that the water was barely drinkable and in some cases toxic. It's believed that the aquifer that supplied water to the wells was contaminated by the James River and the pitch and tar swamp that was also near the settlement. Right. Makes sense. The James River would have been affected by the tide and the rainfall. Mm -hmm. The team is currently trying to determine whether the times in which there was an uptick in deaths at Jamestown coincides with the months in which the water would have been saltiest, namely in the summer. That makes sense, especially since you'd be more prone to dehydration in general mm -hmm. in the hot summer mm -hmm. months and then to drink salt water, which mm -hmm. is like essentially, don't they call that like suicide on ships and stuff and you drink salt water? Yeah, that's not the right term, but it is something along yeah. that, yeah. Pretty much guaranteed death if you start drinking mm -hmm. salt. Going back to the forming of the colony itself. I just thought that was an interesting tidbit, so I wanted to put it in there. Yeah. The Jamestown settlers weren't used to the manual labor involved in cultivating crops. These are military men. Right. They're used to being sent somewhere with everything they need. Mm -hmm. Aside from, like, firewood and shit. Yeah. And as a result of the drought, they depended almost entirely on supply runs from Europe 
and whatever trades they were able to make with the Powhatan. Mm. Two supply ships landed at Jamestown in 1608, a year later, because they came in May of 1607. So the first arrived in January with 100 additional settlers who helped to fortify the settlement. Oh, God. Okay. Now there's 138 because, remember, a whole bunch of them died. Mm -hmm. And in October of 1608, the second supply landed at Jamestown, bringing with it more men, supplies, and the colony's first women, Mistress Forrest and her maid, Anne Burris. That would have been a very dangerous situation for those two women. Like, the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. The whole trip, getting there. Yep. No. Would not have volunteered for that voyage. No. You could not get me on that boat. Could not pay me to do it. Mm -mm. The third supply to Jamestown left London on June 2nd, 1609, and consisted of nine vessels that held not only supplies, but 500 new colonists. 500. To be in this, like, marshy, shitty Mm -hmm. plop of land. Yep. And this is men, women, and children. This 500. Because, ideally, at this point, it would have been like a home. Because it it was three three years? Two years? Two. So, at this point, it's two years. Yeah. So, you would assume that they would have all the buildings and stuff ready to go after two years. So, that by the time they got there... It's all established. It was a town. Yeah. Let's all move in. It's great. It's super happy, fun time. <laughs> so the fleet, which was nine vessels, mm-hmm. ran into a severe storm, most likely a hurricane, that lasted three days. Damn. During that time, two of the ships had been separated during the storm, with one landing at Bermuda on July 28th. <gasps> oh, no. With all 150 that were on board surviving, so that crew and colonists okay and the other ship was lost yeah probably capsized probably done the other seven ships arrived at jamestown in august of 1609 bringing with it even more men women and children but very Mm -hmm. little in the way of provisions since the bulk of those had been on the other two vessels great why evenly distribute you know like we don't need to evenly distribute. Because one of them was like this big, massive ship. Yeah, probably likely like a, a cargo ship, essentially. Yeah, like the Sea Venture. That's what it was called. And that's the one that ended up in Bermuda with most of the supplies. I kind of hope that they were super successful and like really happy in Bermuda. <laughs> well, they did end up leaving some people behind to like establish Bermuda as an English colony. Yeah. But... So they would have been like, you know what? This is kind of nice, you guys. Do you want to just like hang out here forever? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, fun fact, the last settlers to arrive in Virginia, so the ones that came in August, mm-hmm. ate through the seven acres of planted corn that the colony was barely able to raise that year in just three days. Cool. White people do love corn, though. I mean. Yep. And if you had kids, they would have been feral. At that point. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like the kids would it could have eaten all the corn in three days, even if there were like four of them. Mm-hmm. The winter of 1609 and 1610 wasn't kind to the now 300 settlers living in Jamestown. Known as the Starving Time, it resulted in the deaths of hundreds. Mm. This was partially due to strained and hostile relations with the Powhatan, Since the Algonquin, sorry, the Algonquin only had so much food and had to conserve storage to feed their own people. So they were like, you can't trade anymore. Like this, yeah, this isn't their first radio. They, this isn't their first rodeo. They know how to survive because Mm -hmm. they've lived there for hundreds, thousands of years. You know, Mm -hmm. they're like, no, we're done. Understandably, the Algonquin didn't think it was cool beans when some of the Jamestown settlers tried to steal from their food stores. Yeah, yeah. We said no means no, sir. Their chief also had only agreed to trade thanks to the efforts of Captain John Smith, who was part of the uh, initial fleet. Yep. Yeah. Befriender of raccoons. 
cartoon raccoons. John Smith. Yes. Yeah. When John was forced to return to England on October 4th, 1609, following a gunpowder injury he sustained in August, Chief Powhatan stopped trade with the colonists altogether. Yeah. I don't believe Because he was like, that was our guy? Yep. The one reasonable man left. And we don't like you. Yeah. He's like, we're done. We're done. You can't sit with us. Additionally, the Powhatan would kill any settler who set foot outside the Fort Palisade. And they also picked off the livestock the settlers had roaming in the woods. Yeah. You were warned several times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is not just a, like, petty neighbor squabble. This is the survival of their people. Mm Mm-hmm. It's a family versus family thing. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm going to feed mine before I feed yours. Sorry. Yep. To really drive home just how bad relations now were with the Powhatan, here's an excerpt from the historic Jamestown website. Uh Uh-oh. Quote, Acting Governor George Percy sent John Ratcliffe with a 50-man force to the Indian headman, Emperor Powhatan, to trade for corn. Mm-hmm. Only 16 men made it back, empty-handed, except for the report that Ratcliffe had been flayed and burnt alive by Indian women, end quote. Nice. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah, the women were like, you can't fuck with any of us, just so you know. Mm-hmm. You sickly, emaciated pieces of shit. Go home. By the time that spring arrived in 1610, Only 60 of the previous 300 residents had survived. Wow. Okay. Yeah. How many of those became long pig? Truly. I bet a lot of them. Probably a lot. We'll never know for sure. But if you're hungry and two thirds of your people died. Mm -hmm. On June 7th, 1610, the survivors boarded ships intent on reaching the Chesapeake Bay but they were intercepted by another supply convoy from England, led by Lord De La War, that returned them to Jamestown with more supplies and more people. Why? Why would you accept that? Just be like, no, dude, I really just want to go. Like, it's not for me. <laughs> We've got bad neighbors. <laughs> I really condensed that because I could, I could have talked forever about it. Essentially, right. so the people that landed in Bermuda, they came up to Jamestown. And picked up the 60 people that were still there mm-hmm. and they had like no provisions because at that point all their food had spoiled yeah like the extra food they had had spoiled and they're like let's just go let's let's just get out of here we'll try to head back to england it'll be fine let's let's mm-hmm. let's leave and then here comes lord de la war with a bunch of more people a bunch more supplies and he's like come on you guys let's just pick up our bootstraps and they're like, we can't, we ate them all. And then he's like, let's just do yeah. it. Let's just go. And so they go. And within a couple of years, and with the commercialization of tobacco, Jamestown would become the first permanent English settlement and a thriving community. So really rough start. Yeah. But then it was like, cool, we're here now. Mm-hmm. That being said, what was it like for those 60 people? Who survived that harsh winter in 1609 to 1610? PTSD, we don't know her yet. Let's talk about it. Ew. On June 14th, 1610, a Spanish ambassador wrote the following to his king of what he'd heard regarding the Jamestown settlement in the New World. Quote, Sire, from Virginia there has come to line a harbor of this kingdom, A ship of those that remained there lately, and those who arrived in it, report that the Indians hold the English surrounded in the strong place which they had erected there, having killed the larger part of them, and the others were left so entirely without provisions that they thought it impossible to escape, because the survivors eat the dead, and when one of the natives died fighting, they dug him up again two days afterward to be eaten." Which would have only perpetuated the disease and all that other terrible stuff. Sir Thomas Gates, the governor of Jamestown in 1610, provided the following tale that would go on to be published by the Virginia Company of London. So this is the company that would send people to the Virginia colony. Got it. Quote, 
There was one of the company who mortally hated his wife and therefore secretly killed her, then cut her in pieces and hid her in divers parts of his house. When the woman was missing, the man suspected, his house searched, and parts of her mangled body were discovered. To excuse himself, he said that his wife died, that he hid her to satisfy his hunger, and that he fed daily upon her. Upon this, his house was again searched, where they found a good quantity of meal, oatmeal, beans, and peas. He thereupon was arraigned, confessed the murder, and was burned for his horrible villainy. End quote. Yeah, and like awful hoarding too, because mm-hmm. it sounds like he was keeping a lot of good food from other people. Yep. Cool. Mm-hmm. Dirtbag justice. We love to see it. In 1624, a group of Virginia survivors wrote a piece titled, quote, a brief declaration of the plantation of Virginia during the first 12 years down to this present time, end quote. In it, they chronicle the starving times as follows, quote, those hogs, dogs, and horses that were then in the colony, together with rats, mice, snakes, or what vermin or carrion soever we could light on, as also toadstools, Jews' ears, or what else we found growing upon the ground, that would fill either mouth or belly, and were driven through unsufferable hunger unnaturally to eat those things, which nature must most abhorred, the flesh and excrements of man, as well of our own nation as of an Indian, digged by some out of his grave after he had lain buried three days, and wholly devoured him. Others, envying the better shade of body of any whom hunger had not yet so much wasted as their own, lay wait and threatened to kill and eat them. One among the rest slew his wife as she slept in his bosom, cut her in pieces, powdered her, salted her, that's what powdered her means, and fed Mm. upon her till he had devoured all parts saving her head, and was for so barbarous a fact and cruelty justly executed. Some adventuring to seek relief in the woods died as they sought it and were eaten by others who found them dead. End quote. Yeah. I mean, when you put people in this situation, their humanity kind of is one of the first things to go. Well, I mean, you do what you have to do. To yeah. Survive. The need for survival is a very intense thing that hopefully mm-hmm. most of us will never have to really experience. That same year, so 1624, Virginia's General Assembly noted the following in their minutes. Quote, one man out of the misery he endured, killing his wife, powdered her up to eat her, for which he was burned. Many besides fed on the corpses of dead men, and one who had gotten unsatiable out of custom to that food could not be restrained until such time as he was executed for it, end quote. So really liked eating people to the point where it got weird. Yep. So they killed and ate him. (laughs) Yep. Cool. Captain John Smith who was forced to leave Virginia and Jamestown in October of 1609 because of the gunpowder accident. Yeah, taking Pocahontas with him for the Disney 2 movie. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Learned about the cannibalism report and included it in his collected works called General History of Virginia, New England, and the Summer Isles, which was printed in 1624. I would have titled it as gross and oh no. <laughs> My life in hell. (laughs) Quote, Nay, so great was our famine, that a salvage we slew and buried. The poorer sort took him up again and eat him, and so did divers one another boiled and stewed with roots and herbs. And one amongst the rest did kill his wife, powdered her, and had eaten part of her before it was known, for which he was executed, as he well deserved. Now, whether she was better roasted, boiled, or carbonadoed, or barbecued, I know not, but of such a dish as powdered wife, I never heard of, end quote. Are you really trying to make this lighthearted of like, in my next book, I will, I will share the recipes that we have found for the best long pig when you're needing to survive. Bring some thyme, you know, mm-hmm. some rosemary. I was Mary's good. Yeah. George Percy, who I mentioned before, who mm-hmm. was president of the council during the starving time, 
wrote a letter years later in 1625 describing how the colonists fared that fateful winter. Quote, Having fed upon our horses and other beasts as long as they lasted, we were glad to make shift with vermin as dogs, cats, rats, and mice, as to eat boots, shoes, or any other leather. And now famine beginning to look ghastly and pale in every face, that nothing was spared to maintain life and to do those things which seem incredible, as to dig up dead corpses out of graves and to eat them. And some have licked up the blood which hath fallen from their weak fellows. End quote. Whew. Like, yeah. at that point, is, is, the, is the colonization worth it? Like, mm -hmm. they went there as fully fledged humans, and then they left there as like feral, horrific creatures. You don't want to just be like, you know, maybe we should stop sending people here. I think I I don't think it's working. I think God is saying not here. Right. I don't think God was ever there to begin with. If I, if I'm being fully honest, I don't. I, I think he uh, that was one of his blind spots. <laughs> yeah. It was like you know I thought the tar pit swamp would right. have dissuaded you, but you know George also wrote an account titled "A True Relation" that documented the starving time which wouldn't be published until the 1930s. Can I just say too, even, even just calling it the starving time, quote unquote, mm -hmm. is like whitewashing all of it. Like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. they starved. It's like, no, they became monsters out of necessity. Mm -hmm. Like the ruination of people. <laughs> not, yeah. not the starving time. Because it's like, mm, Oh, they lost some weight. Oh no, but they, it like got better. No, it's not getting better. Mm -hmm. It's like it's all bad. Yeah, they ate people consistently yeah. to the point where they liked it. So, mm -hmm. quote: This was most lamentable that one of our colony murdered his wife, ripped the child out of her womb, and threw it into the river, and after chopped the mother in pieces and salted her for his food the same not being discovered before he had eaten part thereof, end quote. Why would he throw away the baby? I was just going to say that. Like, if you're, if you're that far gone and food is food, why would you throw away the baby? Why not that I'm saying go out there right. and grab like, a baby and eat exactly. it. Exactly. Like, don't. Don't, don't twist my word. Right. He must have had some shred of humanity left where he was like, oh, can't eat a baby, but I can for sure murder and eat my wife and rip the baby from her womb and drown mm -hmm. it. But I can't, I mean, eating it is too evil. That's, that's mm -hmm. my limit. That's where I stop. You know, that's my hard stop. Yeah. Hard stop is eating children. At least you knew where the line was. Uh, yes. And that there was one. There was a line, I guess. But are any of these depictions true? Probably a little bit. Preservation Virginia Jamestown Rediscovery Project, which started in 1994, conducted excavations in 2012 at the doomed fort and uncovered a deposit of refuse that contained the carcasses of dogs, cats, and horses that had been consumed during this difficult time, mm -hmm. all cut and chopped up. It was in this pit in August of 2012 in what was once a 1608 cellar, kitchen cellar, hmm. that a startling discovery was made. Julia Child's cookbook. <laughs> How to salt a woman. <laughs> How to powder your wife. Spice up your love life. Human teeth, a severed tibia or a shin bone, mm. and a partial human skull. Mm. Right next to um, the eggshells. So as I've already noted, mm. tales of cannibalism taking place at the New England colonies had previously been bandied about as a ploy for the early colonists to receive additional resources from Europe. Right. The early colonies were rife with factionalism and infighting, and Jamestown was no different. I mean, when you started oh, off yeah. with a bunch of men. Right bunch of dudes and like no real structure i'm not doing the whole oh, oh man whatever 
big boy Lord of the Flies. Exactly. In the case of Jamestown, archaeologists discovered forensic evidence of what they believed to be survival cannibalism. Prior to this, there had been no physical evidence to suggest such a thing, just the sensational stories that had been passed around to defame the colony. Mm. You're telling me that not one or like two or like a handful of those men that agreed to even do this in the first place weren't already kind of off and murdery and saw this as an opportunity to like unlock a new fun thing. It's entirely possible. But what I'm saying is this is the first time they have actual evidence, like hard physical evidence. That there was survival. Yeah. Cannibalism. I, I mean, how else would they have survived? Truly? Yeah. Like the trees said it first. The seller said it last. Yeah. <laughs> like this was a no, a quote unquote known thing. Mm-hmm. They just didn't have any physical evidence to back it up until now. Yeah. Until they saw that partial skull. So that all changed with the discovery of a dismembered skeleton that they dubbed Jane. Oh. The girl was around 14 when she died, based on her molar development, Mm -hmm. and the fragments of her skull bore, quote, hundreds of cut marks, sawing marks along the jaw. Some of them suggest the removal of soft tissue and the brain, end quote, according to Bill Kelso, the chief archaeologist of the Jamestown Rediscovery Project. How sad would that have been to see that? And, like, know that, that that's what happened to her, her body. Like, I really hope she was already dead, you know? Likely she was. But at this point, like, who knows? She might have still been, like, sick. In his next statement, oh, Bill wow. continued, quote, We feel the nature of the first cuts on the skull, which were close together, were done to someone who was either unconscious or already dead. End Good. quote. I really hope she was already So she was, like, freshly deceased. Oh, God. Freshly deceased to me, though, means that, like, she might might have still been alive. Their belief was that she wasn't murdered, that she was already dead before all the stuff happened. The discovery, which was made public in 2013, hence why most of my sources are from 2013. Right. According to Jim Horn, who is the vice president of research and historical interpretation with Colonial Williamsburg, was like, quote, the needle in the haystack, end quote. I bet. I bet 20, like all those researchers were just like buzzing that they could confirm. Using CT scans on the bones, they then replicated them virtually using 3D modeling, laboriously reconstructing the skull piece by piece. Although they only had around 66% of the skull, they were able to fill in the gaps with 3D facial reconstruction. Douglas Ousley, forensic anthropologist of the Smithsonian, analyzed the bones. Quote, the chops to the forehead are very tentative, very incomplete. Then the body was turned over and there were four strikes to the back of the head, one of which was the strongest and split the skull in half. A penetrating wound was then made to the left temple, probably by a single-sided knife, which was used to pry open the head and remove the brain. The clear intent was to remove the facial tissue and the brain for consumption. These people were in dire circumstances, so any flesh that was available would have been used. The person that was doing this was not experienced and did not know how to butcher an animal. Instead, we see hesitancy, trial, tentativeness, and a total lack of experience, end quote. That makes me really sad. It makes me wonder if it was like a caregiver or a relative or somebody that knew them. Douglas believes that Jane likely arrived in Jamestown on a resupply ship in June of 1609 and was likely a maidservant or a child of a gentleman. This was determined via isotope analysis of her bones, suggesting that she had a high-protein diet, which would put her more in the vein of someone who was a child of means, but not necessarily of the upper crust. Okay, so middle class, upper middle class. Yep. 
According to a New York Times article, quote, the ratio of oxygen isotopes in her bones indicated that she had grown up in the southern coastal regions of England, and the carbon isotopes pointed to a diet that included English rye and barley, end quote. That's insane that they can figure that out. Yeah. Like, that's insane. That's crazy. Science is awesome. Additionally, her skeleton also had low lead levels, unlike the rich settlers of Jamestown, who were known to eat off pewter dishes, essentially giving themselves lead poisoning. Cute. Douglas is also of the mind that Jane was cannibalized by more than one person, as cut marks on her shin bones are indicative of someone with more experience at butchering than whoever had dismembered her head. Okay, so maybe like the family member wanted to be the one to do that, and then they might have like given the body to the community after. Because like, how how do you eat a person? Like how how do you do that? Yeah. Like remove the face. In an interview with Reuters, Douglas shared, "Quote." By 1609, the settlement was effectively operating under siege, with many of the male colonists killed by hostile Native Americans after venturing out. Those who remained inside Jamestown's confines were often women, children, and the sick. Those who dismembered Jane might well have been women, end quote. Yeah, could have been. Well, and you can tell that, like, the Native people, they we're isolating them to die like they were like you're gonna die anyway so just Mm -hmm. stay there and stop messing with us Mm -hmm. it's us or them and they chose them Mm -hmm. based on the state of her remains it's his belief that her brain was likely eaten first as it decomposes the fastest followed by her tongue cheeks and the muscles in her legs can uh, why Why do we need to know that? (laughs) Why do we need to know the order of of the courses of the meal? I don't know. I just... The scrapes, Mm. all of the side and base of the jawbone, indicate that whoever was dismembering her head with what appeared to be a fine knife were doing so with the intention of getting every last ounce of flesh from the bone. Yeah, that's desperation. Mm Mm-hmm. As I mentioned earlier, or as it was kind of included in a quote, prior to the discovery of Jane, artifacts suggested that the settlers had done their best to survive on what wild animals they were able to find and kill, such Mm -hmm. as turtles, snakes, and black rats, after they had already eaten their domestic animals of cats, dogs, and horses, as well as any leather. And the fact that the settlers turned to survival cannibalism rather than giving up shows just how awful the conditions they had to endure were. Yeah. Douglas and others who have examined Jane's remains, which only make up 10% of her actual skeleton, believe it's only a matter of time before more bones are discovered. In his own words, Douglas states, quote, there are other examples mentioned here and there in the literature. So the only question is, where are the rest of the bodies? End quote. Mm. Let's not disturb (laughs) these people who have already had some pretty horrific experiences. Like, that is just bad juju all around. Mm -hmm. That is like, that is like opening a tomb in Egypt and like the dust comes out in like a dust dome. Like, like, let's just not, you know, we don't have to. Yeah. We know. Thanks, Jane, for the knowledge. We're good now. Mm -hmm. We did it. Yeah. Well, it's like they purposefully buried all of their dead inside of the fort. Mm -hmm. One, so they wouldn't be going outside of the fort and then being killed by the Powhatan. But also to hide just how many of them were passing Mm -hmm. from the Powhatan. So it's like how many of those victims were reinterred Mm -hmm. after they had been consumed and we just haven't dug them up to see if they had been cannibalized or not. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. not that I'm saying, hey, let's go, let's go digging around in people's graves. Like, that's a great idea. And see, and see who has. And I just graves. don't know. 
yeah, like maybe, maybe that has been done and, you know, it didn't pan out or whatever. But Mm -mm. I also think that they probably wouldn't have tried to keep that kind of stuff around after everything was said and done. Especially if if they still were God-fearing people, like they're doing kind of the ultimate sin and weren't weren't the people of james jamestown weren't they like puritans and stuff like weren't they kind of more devout or maybe not since it was a military base i don't know i don't know how big of a factor religion really was they were anglican so they were part of the church of england whereas Mm -hmm. the pilgrims were the ones that were Puritans and <laughs> so so Church of England, aka Henry the Eighth's <laughs> Devil May Care. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So that was Jamestown and the Starving Time. Horrific. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> you really thanks for starting starting the year with Long Pig. Really appreciate it. It's great. I did it on purpose for you. Because I love you. <laughs> I saw it in my list and I was like, I need, I need, I need to do it. Oh my God. Hey, creepy people. This is PNW Haunts and Homicides. I'm Caitlin. And I'm Cassie. Together, we explore stories of the paranormal and true crime throughout the Pacific Northwest. For each episode, we do a tarot reading to help us gain some insight on the topic as we share the facts of the case and our interpretations. You can find our episodes featuring true stories from infamous cases such as the misdeeds of Boeing, as well as lesser known true crime cases like the murders in Tunnel 13 as well as our spooky stories from Pike Place and Raven's Manor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else you'd like to listen. Have Have a a creepy-ass day! This month's podcast plug is the PNW Haunts and Homicides podcast. Join Caitlin and Cassie as they chat about true crime, the paranormal, and all kinds of spooky shit in the Pacific Northwest. And we will have a link to their show in the show notes so you can give them a listen. Nice. And this week's listener question is from our friend Carrie Ann. Hi, Carrie. And she would like to know what historic disasters before the 1900s interest you the most and why? Hmm. Dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. That's all I need to say. Why? Dinosaurs. I just want to know. I want to know about them. Were they like puppies? Were they not? Were they all just like horrific now emus and like eels, like just gross, gnarly looking things? And like, what did it look like when the earth changed and wiped them out? Ice Age too, maybe. That would be interesting. What about you? The Franklin Expedition. Mm. That was, for people who don't know, that was the, I do... I probably will cover it at some point because it's fascinating. But it's the 1845 to 1848 British expedition led by Sir John Franklin, which ended in one of the worst disasters in the history of polar exploration. Yeah, that would be a good one. You should do that in February since February is the coldest month (laughs) where we live. Speaking of polar vortex... (laughs) I just love that you actually have an expedition in mind. In mine, we're like, dinosaurs! <laughs> the Northwest Passage Expedition. That's what it was. So it was the HMS Erebus and the HMS Terror. And that's the one that... Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the book. Yeah. There was a show a few years ago. And, yeah. I feel like there was cannibalism in that one, too. There was. So, yeah. Here's that Thanks, Carrie Ann. <laughs> History's just full of long pig, you know? So much long pig. Ah. All right, on that note, instead of doing something good, mm-hmm. what is something you're excited for this month? Something I'm excited for? Mm-hmm. I get to finally meet a lot of my coworkers in like three weeks for the first time. So I, um, nice. I work for a fully remote company and I have only met two of my colleagues. There's like 300 some of us I think in total but I actually get to meet my fellow project managers and like the implementers and stuff 
at a work retreat the third week of third or fourth week of January. And so I'm just really excited to finally meet all these people I talk to and like all the time Mm -hmm. (laughs) and see what they're like in person. They're all really excited to meet Willie, but like who wouldn't be, you know? This is true. How about you? I am working on an author interview that will take place at the end of the month. And nice. it's going to be about a really cool story. So I'm excited to read the book and then talk to the author and then share the story with all of you guys. It is seafaring related. And that's all I'm going to tell you because I don't want to spoil anything, but I'm pretty excited to have our first author interview of the new year. Nice. That is exciting. It's kind of cool that we get to do things like that, you know, like how many mm-hmm. people can say that they read a book and then are able to talk to the author. Mm-hmm. It's cool. This is true. All right. Shall we? We shall. Got something you want to say? Shoot us an email over at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your story ideas, see any gifts you send our way, or if you just want to say hello. We're pretty friendly. Speaking of friendly, if you'd like to have real-time conversations with us, consider joining our Discord over at the Cultivate Network. You can chat with us over at the Old Crimers Cubby or catch up with any of the other great creators that are part of the Cultivate family of podcasts. Just click the link in our show notes or over on our link tree to get started today. If you're interested in ad-free content, consider supporting us with a one-time donation either over on Buy Me a Coffee or our Venmo page, both of which are in our link tree and in the show notes. A great way to support the show if you want to help us out but you can't do so financially is to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Good Pods, Podcast Addict, and Audible. Looking for more content? You can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. If you'd like to see pictures from this week's episode, not to mention bonus content and funny memes, make sure to follow us on Twitter at Yield Crime Pod and on Facebook and Instagram at Yield Crime Podcast. On TikTok, of course you are. Follow us at Yield Crime Podcast. I do know the dates for our Tea Public January sales. They will not be coming up until next week. So keep your eyes peeled on January 11th through the 14th when you can enjoy 35% off everything in our store. Nice. If you want a playlist of all our episodes on YouTube, click the link in our show notes or in our link tree and subscribe today for not only a list of our full catalog, but a separate list as well, just of our Can You Crack the Cramp Word segments. And on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime.